Welcome back to Deep Learning. Today we want to look a bit more into visualization techniques and in particular the gradient-based and optimization-based procedures. You wanted to know what the matrix is in the end? Okay, so let's say what I've got for you. Let's talk first about the gradient-based visualizations. And here the idea is that we want to figure out which input pixel is most significant to a neuron and if we would change it what would cause a large variation in the actual output of our neural network try to relax so what we actually want to compute is the partial derivative of the neuron under consideration maybe an output neuron like for the class cat and then we want to compute the partial derivative of respect to the respective input and this is essentially back propagation through the entire network and then we can visualize this gradient as type of image which we have been doing here for this cat image and you can see that of course this is a color gradient you see that this is a bit of a noisy image but you can see that what is related to cat here is obviously also located in the area where the cat is actually located in the image this will feel a little weird so we will learn several different approaches to do this and the first one is based here on reference number 20. For backpropagation, we actually need a loss, what we want to backpropagate, and we simply take a pseudo loss that is simply the activation of an arbitrary neuron or layer. And typically, what you want to do is you want to take neurons in the output layer because they can be associated to a class. And what you can also do is instead of using backpropagation, you can build a nearly equivalent alternative which uses a kind of reverse network. And this is the deconf net from reference N26. So here the input is the trained network and some image. Then you choose one activation and set all of the other activations to zero. Then you build a reverse network and you can see the idea here that this is essentially containing the same as the network but just in reverse sequence with so-called unpooling steps and now with these unpooling steps and the reverse computation you can see that we can also produce a kind of gradient estimate. The nice thing about this one is there's no training involved so you just have to record the pooling location in the switches and the forward pass of the reverse network effectively is the same as the backward pass of the network apart from the rectified linear units which we'll look at in a couple of slides. This is the construct. And here we show the visualizations of the top nine activations, the gradient and the corresponding patch. So for example, you can reveal with this one that this kind of feature map seems to focus on green patchy areas and you could argue that this is more a kind of background feature that tries to detect grass patches in the image. Anything we need. Right now, we're inside a computer program. So, what else? Well, there's guided backpropagation, and guided backpropagation is a very similar concept. And the idea here is that you want to find positively correlated features. So we are looking for positive gradients because we assume that the features that are positive are the ones that the neuron is interested in, and the negative gradients are the ones that the neuron is not interested in. So the idea is then to set all negative gradients in the backpropagation to zero and we can show you now the different processes of the relu during the forward and backward passes with the different kinds of gradient backpropagation techniques. Well of course if you have this input activations then in the forward pass in the relu you would simply 
cancel out all the negative values and set them to zero. Now what happens in the backpropagation for the three different alternatives? Let's look at what the typical backpropagation does and note that we show here the negative entries that came from the sensitivity in yellow and if you now try to backpropagate this you have to remember which entries in the forward pass were negative and you set those values again to zero but you keep everything that came from the sensitivity of the previous layer. Now if you do deconfnet you don't need to remember the switches from the forward pass but you set all the entries that are negative in the sensitivity to zero and backpropagate this way. Now the guided backpropagation actually does both so it remembers the forward pass and sets all of those elements to zero and it sets all of the elements of the sensitivities to zero so it's essentially a union of backpropagation and deconfnet in terms of cancelling negative values. And you can see that the guided backpropagation only keeps very little sensitivity throughout the entire backpropagation process. Is it really so hard to believe? Now let's look at the comparison of the different gradients and one thing that you can see is that in deconfnet we get pretty noisy activations in backpropagation we can see that we at least focus on the object of interest and the guided backpropagation has a very sparse representation but you can here very clearly see even in this gradient image the most important features like the eyes of the cat and so on. So this is a very nice way that might help you reveal which neurons focus on what activity in that specific input. This then finally leads to saliency maps and here you don't want to investigate what influences the neurons but you want to investigate the impact of pixels on a class score. So now you take the pseudo loss as unnormalized class score and compute the gradient with respect to the image pixels and use absolute values. Then the interesting observations that we make with this is that it kind of produces a saliency map that localizes the dog in the image even though the network was never trained on localization. So this is a very interesting approach that can help you to identify where the decisive information is actually located in the image. The matrix is a system, Neil. What else can be done? Well, there's parameter visualization or optimization. And now the idea is that we want to go towards different levels. So we want to optimize with respect either to a neuron, to an activation map, a layer, the actual logits, or the class probability, essentially the softmax function. And we take them as pseudo loss in order to create optimal inputs. When you're inside, you look around, what do you see? Businessmen, teachers, lawyers, carpenters. And we've already seen something very similar in the first video where we had this example from Deep Dream and Inceptionism. This is essentially doing something very similar. It takes some input and then it alters the input such that different neurons are maximally activated and there you can see that these neurons somehow encode specific parts of animals or things that it likes to recognize and if you now maximize the input with respect to that particular neuron you can see that then the shapes that it likes start to appear in this image. So the idea is that you change the input such that the neuron is maximally activated. So we are essentially not just computing the gradient up to the image, but we are also actively changing the image with respect to that particular neuron or layer or softmax or output. And the original idea was, of course, layer visualization. And many of them are so inert, so hopelessly dependent on the system that they will fight to protect it. 
So you try to understand the inner workings of the networks by dreaming about when presented with images and you start with the image or even noise as input and then you adjust the image towards maximizing activations in a complete layer and for different layers it highlights different things in the image so we can create this kind of inceptionism if you activate mostly early layers you see that the image content is not that much changed but you create those brush and stroke like appearances in the images were you listening to me neo or were you looking at the woman in the red dress i was look again Freeze it. now you can even go ahead and start this with a random input but then it's not just optimizing the input with respect to a specific output class. You need some additional regularization and we can show this here in this small formula. So we are now taking some input X, which is a random image. We feed it into our network and a specific neuron or output neuron. And then we maximize the activation and we add a regularizer. And this regularizer punishes if our X deviates from a specific norm and what is used in this example it's simply the l2 norm later we will also see that maybe also other norms may be suitable for this so you start with this noise input that we show on the top right and then you optimize until you find a maximum activation for that specific neuron or layer and at the same time you postulate that your input image somehow has to be smooth because otherwise you would be generating these very, very noisy images and they are not so nice for interpretation. And of course, the bottom right image shows you some kind of structures that you now can interpret. So you see these abstract features emerging and then you can use this as a kind of cascade from small to large scales, and this produces the so-called inceptionism. It's another training program designed to teach you one thing. If you are not one of us, you are one of them. Here we can use that, for example, to reveal hidden weaknesses in the neural network classification process. Here we see different realizations for the class dumbbell, and you can see it's not only the dumbbell that is shown in the image, but it is also recreating the arm that is holding the dumbbell. So we can see here that correlated things are kind of learned when they have been presented to the network. So we kind of can figure out what the memory of that specific class or neuron with respect to the input is. So again, we learn once more, good data is really important. This actually leads us to another step that we could do in order to figure out what's happening inside of the neural network. And these are inversion techniques. And here the idea is very similar to what we've seen in these kind of inceptionism ideas. But now we actually want to invert from the activation what was the actual input. So the idea is, and what you hear quite frequently for example, a security measure that if you want to somehow anonymize data, let's just take the activations of layer five, discard all the previous activations and inputs, and we just store the layer five activations because there is no way how I can reconstruct the original image if I only know the layer five activation or layer six activation. What are you trying to tell me? That I can dodge bullets? No, Neo. Now, with inversion, you can actually show if you know the network and what it's processing and you know the specific activations for a specific layer, then you can try to reconstruct what the actual input was. So again, we have the output of our network in that particular layer. So let's say f of x is the output of a layer. And we have y hat. And now y hat is the measured network output or the measured layer activation, so the layer five activation. And we don't know what the input X is, so we are looking for X and we try to minimize this function such that we find 
with some input x the best match to that specific activation. This is a classical inverse problem. And you add, in order to get more stable output, an additional regularizer, lambda times r of x. And this regularizer is something that is very important. So the regularizer stabilizes the inversion. And there's very common techniques for regularization that use specific properties of natural images in order to create something that is likely a natural image. So, of course, high frequency noise would degrade the reconstructions. This is why we used in Inceptionism this additional L2 norm in order to prevent the appearance of noise in the created images. In addition to that, you can also use the so-called total variation. We know that natural images typically have sparse gradients and total variation is a minimization techniques that enforces your image to have a very low number of gradients. Well, gradients are essentially edges and in a typical image there is only few edge pixels and many more homogeneous areas. So TV minimization produces images that have few edges and of course also few noise, but it specifically also allows high jumps, piecewise constant jumps, like in real edges. Of course, you could also work with low pass and other edge preserving filters. Very classical one is the TV regularization. So this is simple, it's effective, and of course it will also suppress real edges and other high frequency information. Well, what else can be done? You can also use other regularizers like transform robustness. So the input should actually be invariant to spatial transformation. So this is similar idea as data augmentation and therefore you can randomly rotate scale or jitter x. Uh, so this is also very simple and it's uh, effective in producing recognizable features, but often the orientation is suppressed even if it was informative, so we have to be careful about that. And a last kind of regularizer, which is very common, is that you have learned priors. So, for example, you can use a trained network and say, I want to have a specific distribution in layer number four, and then I try to generate images that have a very similar characteristic here. So, instead of optimizing with respect to a specific norm that we know that is useful. We assume that the representations that are produced in a specific layer are useful in order to measure the content of the image and then you can actually use this as a kind of regularizer to produce images. So of course you need a trained generative model if you want to use things like this. This produces very nice images but it may be ambiguous because parts of what you introduce into the results stems from the pre-trained network. So uh, this you have to see this with a bit of caution. I'm trying to tell you that when you're ready, you won't have to. So let's look at some examples that reference 14 actually generated by inversion. And this is pretty impressive. So again, this is an AlexNet type of network. And here you have the input and then the inversion of conf layer one. You can see we can almost exactly reproduce the image. After relu, not much changed, pooling, no big effect, then second layer and so on. And you can see that up to convolution layer four, we are very close to the true input. And this has undergone several steps of pooling already, and still we are able to reproduce the input very closely to the original input. Very interesting. And I only low the layer 4 activations. And then you see that I really have to go towards, let's say, layer 6 or layer 7 until I reach a point where it becomes impossible or close to impossible to guess what the original input was. So only at layer 6 or layer 7 we start deviating significantly from the original input. Still, until layer 5, we can reconstruct quite well what the original input was.
So if anybody tells you that they want to uh, anonymize data by cutting off the first two layers, then you see that with these inversion techniques, this is maybe not such a great idea. And it's not unlikely that you will be able to reconstruct the original input only by means of seeing the activations and the network structure. Only human. Dodge this. Okay, so next time we want to talk about a second topic that is somewhat related to visualization. We want to talk about attention and attention mechanisms. You've already seen that with those visualization techniques we can somehow figure out which pixels are related to what kind of classification and now we want to spin this a little further and using this into kind of guiding the attention, the focus of attention of the network towards specific areas. So this will also be a very interesting video and looking forward to see you in the next video. Bye bye. Thank you.